it isn't just building a bridge or helping a hospital. It is also, here we go, reproducing capitalism, the inequalities. All those corporations will make sure to give the most money possible to the shareholders and the top executives and the least to their workers. That's why we have the gap between the rich, who are the first group, and the not so rich, who are the rest of us. We are reproducing. And the same politician who signs the Inflation Reduction Act or the We Will Rebuild the Infrastructure of America Act or whatever, the same politician who says, I'm concerned about inequality, by signing contracts with these corporations is making sure that that inequality is reproduced by those corporations who are the ones whose payment program produced it in the first place. Oh, snap. So, look, are we continuing this inequality through our federal dollars? Uh huh. <laughs> this commentary by Dr. Richard Wolf really put a new perspective in my mind. Like, it's kind of, you ever have those moments where you kind of know this? But when somebody explains it in a different way, it kind of clicks, right? And a lot of times people talk about government spending. A lot of people on the right will talk about, oh my God, we're spending so much in the government and it's going to bankrupt us somehow when the federal dollars that we actually use in the government aren't used from taxation. Because if that was the case, then we should be, have been bankrupt when the government decided to dump $4 trillion into the stock market during the beginning of the pandemic back in March of that year, 2021, right? But we haven't. With that being said, then when we talk about spending, a lot of times we talk about spending in the military industrial complex. We talk about spending uh, by giving subsidies to a lot of these corporations, whether it's big pharma, subsidies to the fossil fuel companies, things like that. But there's a question that Professor Richard Wolf actually asks that some people just don't really ask. So we're going to go into that because I think that's also deeply important. If you guys have not already, I think you guys should subscribe to uh, Economic Update with Professor Richard Wolf because I think it's deeply important as well. And so let's go in here because I have a few things that I wanted to, to bring out as well. All right, let's go. By the way, this song goes hard. <laughs> I gotta love it. This song goes hard. It ain't got no business going this hard, but it does. Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, a weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives and those of our children. I'm your host, Richard Wolf. I want to remind you that we have a volunteer, Charlie Fabian who is standing by if you have suggestions for topics you'd like to see us present. Here's the email, charlie.info438 at gmail.com, charlie.info. Today's program, <clears throat> excuse me, is going to be devoted to how to understand government spending. I'm particularly interested in government spending on major projects, the defense of the country, if you like, bridges, roads, highways, medical systems, all kinds of goods and services. I'll go over them. I want to present an analysis of government spending along the lines 
you probably haven't thought about, but should be part of our national discussion. And there are fairly obvious reasons why that hasn't happened. And I think you'll see the relevance and the importance once I go through it. One way to get into it is to say that when the government spends money, there are kind of two things to think about. <clears throat> what is it spending the money on? Is it to repair our bridges? Is it to provide uh, a kind of insurance program for the elderly? Is it to support health in our hospitals? Is it for national defense? Is it, and to answer those questions, these are questions about what the government is spending on. But the next question is not asked, but ought to be. How is that money going to be used? How is the bridge going to be built? How are the bullets going to be made? How is the health care services going to be supported? So one of the things that I want to bring up is that a lot of times when you have like for instance let's say the state of the union address right every president will talk about oh we need to do infrastructure we need we need to have an infrastructure project that's made in america blah 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 but in what way is that infrastructure going to be built right how is it going to be built with what company are we going to be building this infrastructure? Because a lot of times we just go, just build it, just spend it, and that's it. A lot of times, it's just like, it's just like having a household and it's like, I don't care how the household gets paid for as long as it gets paid for, but nobody actually talks about how the money is made, right? Or some people really do care about how the money is made, right? But it's like once you find out, it's like, well, I don't want that money because that may be money that's made through unethical means. Are we spending our federal dollars in unethical ways in order to achieve things like infrastructure? Because a lot of times, we care about how it's being spent, especially now that our government constantly says, oh, we need to defend the homeland. We're, look at how many people keep bringing up, you know, us spending money by giving it to Nazis in Ukraine and, and Zionists in Israel. So we do care about how, but how often do we talk about it from a domestic aspect? I think this is important. Let's continue. To make it dramatic, let me give you an example. Suppose the government said that one of the things it was going to do was build some roads in an area that needs them, and that it was going to sign a contract with a slavery outfit. You know, a group of masters who have a bunch of slaves, and they were going to get a contract to build the road. And they would do it by putting their slaves, people they own, to that project. Well, I can hear this, the screams of outrage, and rightly so. We don't want our government to be what? Supporting slavery by giving contracts to slave masters? I get it. Or Zionism. <laughs> Let's continue. That. So, in fact, we do care, don't we, about how the work is done that the government decides to spend on. Let me give you another example. Suppose the government was going to build some roads, but decided that the way it wanted to have it done was by a cooperative, a group of people who together would build the road. It would include engineers to design it and earth-moving specialists and machine operators and all the different people needed 
for road building, but they would work as a cooperative, as a little community, one person, one vote, who decides everything collectively in a democratic way. In other words, it would be a worker co-op. Well, that would be a completely different arrangement. In our society, the United States today, and in most of the world, when contracts are given, they are given to what are more or less capitalist enterprises, not given to slave masters, not given to worker co-ops, given to capitalists. And what does that mean? Owners of enterprises, boards of directors of corporations, they get the check from the government to pay for building a bridge, building a road, building an aircraft carrier, whatever it is operating a hospital. So now let's be clear. When the government gives money to a capitalist corporation, which is what most of government spending is about, it is pouring money into a particular social organization, the capitalist structure of enterprises, because that's what we have. But that has consequences. Let me be very clear. Capitalist corporations, when they get that money from the government, will do with that money from the government just what they do with money from private people who buy from them, who sign contracts with them. We as consumers, other businesses who buy from one another. And what does the corporation do with all of that revenue? Well, we know because the corporations tell us they maximize profit with that money because that's what they're in business to do. They try to minimize the amount they give to working people by getting cheaper workers if they can, by automating, replacing workers with machines if they can by moving production overseas where workers are cheaper to buy if they can. We know that's what they do because they've been doing it for as long as we can remember. So, yeah, um, let's talk about it because the thing is, it's like a lot of times we'll talk about like the Raytheons, the Northrop Grumman's, the General Dynamics, all these different uh, military industrial complex companies, right? But what are we talking about domestically as far as some of these countries, um, uh, these companies that get contracts as well when it comes to domestic affairs, right? Some of these companies that get contracts uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, our digital infrastructure, right? You know, these companies like, let's say, let's say Joe Biden uh, puts out a government contract to put in fiber optic cables, you know, for high-speed broadband, right, in, in a rural area. Well, who gets that money and who gets that contract to build that high-speed broadband? And then that company, that corporation that typically the government does, well, are they using the best possible tools and raw materials in order to input that high-speed broadband? Is it going to be, you know, have any lead casing that could damage our environment, but it's something or, or a substance that's used encasing the fiber optic cables that could bleed into our environment, but it, because it's cheaper, they're going to use that because they're getting that guaranteed government money, so they're going to try to, you know, send that profit to the shareholders and the CEOs as much as possible, how are, how are they paying the workers? Are they paying the workers a living wage? I'm not talking about, oh, $15 an hour. No, I'm talking about a living or a thriving wage. Are they actually paying the workers? And then are they making sure that there's enough workers so that they don't run on a skeleton crew so that the workers don't become overworked? And then they're pushing them to do so much more than what they can do in a, in a, in, a, in that period of time. Like 
what type of companies are we actually giving these this money to? And what are they doing for the workers, for our environment? Are they actually companies that should get our federal dollars when it comes to building our infrastructure? Because we talk about it when it comes to the wars, we talk about it when it comes to defense, but are we talking about it when it comes to how we operate here at home? This is actually a really good question. I don't think a lot of people ask, or if they do, it's kind of under the surface. It's not as prominent of a question that gets asked as much as I think should be asked. But take it away, Dr. Wolf. I'm sorry, Professor Wolf. You know what else they do? Try to give really nice high executive salaries. You know what else they do? Pay dividends to their shareholders. Capital gains by growing the company. And you know what else they do? And this is the cute part. They take part of the money that comes in and use it to donate to the political parties and candidates who voted the money into their hands with the contract in the first place. Now, here's the thing that everybody needs to learn now. The fact is, is that when people, especially a lot of conservatives, rail against government, oh my God, the problem is government. This is how capitalism works. It's not, oh, it's crony capitalism. No, 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 no. What do capitalists need to do in order to maximize profits? They also need to manipulate the government into making conditions so that they can maximize profits even more than what they do. So they go to the rule makers and then they puppet the rule makers to make the rules that actually make it better for them instead of for us. That's how capitalism works. So ultimately, they have to rig the game in order for them to actually make out like bandits. This is how it works. So people go, oh my God, it's not capitalism, it's crony capitalism. Whether it's chicken pot pie, chicken salad, chicken cordon bleu, fried chicken, chicken cacciatore, chicken tetrazzini, whatever chicken it is, it's still what? chicken. Right? It's not, oh my God, it's capitalism, it's crony capitalism. It's still capitalism. That's all it is. This is how it works because the profit maximization by the workers, I'm sorry, not by the workers, by the sole people who own the means of production, well, their, their goal is to rig the system so that it benefits just them. No matter what way you look at it, the system needs to be rigged, but it needs to be rigged for the maximization of the most people. That means the workers. The system's gonna be rigged either way you look at it. You might as well rig it for the people who actually do the work. This is why we talk about a dictatorship of the proletariat. Proletariat being the workers, being people like you and me, not these predators, these leeches on our society. This is why if it was up to the workers, there will be a whole lot more equal and equitable system than what we have now. But this is how they operate because they will do what it takes to keep the system, the government working just for them. Tiny little sliver of people. And when it comes to government contracts, they do that too. Ooh, wait, this is great. Let's continue. Ooh, this is getting downright incestuous, isn't it? Yup. Here's the way to say this in a simple way. When the government of the United States hands out contracts, it isn't just building a bridge or helping a hospital. It is also, here we go, reproducing capitalism. 
the inequalities. All those corporations will make sure to give the most money possible to the shareholders and the top executives and the least to their workers. That's why we have the gap between the rich, who are the first group, and the not so rich, who are the rest of us. We are reproducing. And the same politician who signs the Inflation Reduction Act or the We Will Rebuild the Infrastructure of America Act or whatever, the same politician who says, I'm concerned about inequality, by signing contracts with these corporations is making sure that that inequality is reproduced by those corporations who are the ones whose payment program produced it in the first place. Oh, snap. So, look, are we continuing this inequality through our federal dollars? Uh huh. <laughs> so, when progressives come to you and go, Well, we just want to do a Green New Deal, which I fully agree with, we need to actually have a system where we actually improve our environment and get rid of this system that perpetuates uh, the, the degradation of our environment, right? The, the perpetuation of climate change, right? We need to get rid of that. But what good is it if we're going with some of these companies, some of these corporations that continue the inequality, or they will use products that are still bad for our environment, but they're saying, oh, we're doing our best, right? And, and we're paying for infrastructure to do the Green New Deal. But it's like, what companies are you paying to do the Green New Deal? Like, I don't want to give money to Exxon, even though Exxon may be building solar panels, I don't want to give money to Exxon. Now, if Exxon was to be created into a worker co-op and they're transitioning away from fossil fuels in order to build solar panels, then yes. But also, how are they harvesting the materials to make those solar panels? Are they damaging the environment in order to make those solar panels in the first place? Also, are these same companies, are they also exploiting the people in the global south in order to get some of their raw materials in order to do it? Oh, my God. We're going to uh, use some of this federal money in order to make more electric vehicles. But what good is making these electric vehicles if they're exploiting people in the global south to mine the lithium that he needs to go into these electric vehicles? See? Because the goal is to be free of the exploitation. But if we're using our federal dollars to continue the cycle of exploitation, what good is it? This is why when we talk about the system of capitalism, the entire system is corrupt. See? Because people will point to the Euro Europe and they'll be like, oh my God, well, we want European social, social democracy, European style social democracy. And they'll look at Finland, Iceland, Sweden, Norway, France, Germany, Spain, Italy. They'll look at all these different companies, oh, sorry, not companies, these countries, and they'll go, well, look at how good the people there have it, right? Which, in reality, yeah, a, a majority of the people actually do have it better than we do here. But why? How? Just ask the people in Africa. Just ask Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Nigeria. Ask all these countries where, let's be real, their people are exploited in order to benefit whom? European social democracies. So ultimately, we have to look at them too. It's not just that we're spending money on infrastructure, but how? I think that's deeply important.
Let's continue. That's why it matters that you might give it to a worker co-op contract. You know why? Because worker co-ops don't give huge amounts of money to small groups of themselves while everybody else has a hard time living from paycheck to paycheck, giving their kid a college education and all the rest. In other words, it matters a lot, not just what the government spends on, but what kind of an entity it gives all that money to. By giving it to capitalist corporations, it reproduces the inequalities that haunt this society. It subsidizes them. It reproduces them. And it doesn't have to. So I think the question is, it's not just giving money to corporations, companies, but what types of companies actually what types of companies do we actually give our money to? That matters just as much as what the company does. Because we can say, oh my God, this company is doing some great work, but how are these companies structured? Because if the company structured to produce and maximize profits for a small group of people while leaving their workers by the wayside, are we actually doing the good that we say that we want to happen? Let's continue. Doesn't have to. The government could decide that it would be much more healthy for the United States <clears throat> to have the government give half the money to capitalist corporations, if you still want to, and half the money to worker co-ops. Help develop the worker co-ops so you can give We'll see how they perform. Who does the better job? Why are we not having these discussions, these experiments, and deciding on the evidence rather than refusing to give the money to anything other than a capitalist corporation? Let the markets decide. Isn't that what free market fundamentalists say? Let the markets decide? Okay, well, it also matters how the company is. So if a company is structured like a worker co-op, all right, let's let people make that choice whether they want to go with a co-op or corporation, right? If you really care about choice, then let's start introducing choice, right? Let's continue. Look, other Americans have understood this, if not quite in these terms. Minorities in America noticed over the long history of this country, that government, captured mostly by white male persons, tended to give contracts to corporations run by white male persons. So the women said there has to be money set aside for, or, or the ethnic minorities, it doesn't matter. Whoever was left out of the game said, hey, we want some of these contracts set aside for us. And there are some programs to do that. Well, worker co-ops are just as deserving. They've been excluded even more than corporations run by women or corporations run by non-whites. And they could revolutionize the way this country works because they have different ways of distributing income. They're much more egalitarian. They much more take care of their members' many needs, not just the salary, and so on. 
So it matters. We ought to broaden the conversation about government spending. So it's not just on what is the government spending, but how is it spending whatever it decides to spend? On what kind of corporations who have what kind of impact on our society? We know that the capitalist system has had the impact that we have. Women's earning less than men, women subordinated to men, non-whites earning less than whites, non-whites more un unemployed than whites. And we know the story. We know a few people are billionaires while a mass of people are having hard time. We know that capitalist ways of doing things are producing a society which has many weaknesses, flaws, and failures. It's simple common sense then. If we know that the government has it within its power to buy the things we want as a society from worker co-ops, who would handle all those other issues differently, instead of capitalist corporations, there ought to be a lot of that going on. If you truly care about equality, then why not use a more equitable and equal business structure and company to produce the infrastructure that we need? Why not? If I know of a company that has, yeah, they, they may be a big corporation, but they, the way they treat their workers is horrible. What good is it me giving them my money and saying that I care about workers? Man. This is an argument that the worker co-op movement ought to put in the forefront of its organizing activities because millions and millions of people who already see the benefits of a, of a well, fund where they work, of a where they work. Those are the beginnings of effort, collective behavior. They could. Why are we still banking with corporate corporate banks in our local governments? I mean, if anything, I mean, we should have or what I talked about with Nelson Betancourt, uh, public bank that is in our own local governments. Why not have that? They don't want to do a public then maybe instead of banking with corporate banks, then could our local governments bank with a credit union instead? But they don't want to because the corporations want that money. They want that contract. Something that I think is a worthy conversation to have see that worker co-ops would be a better way for the government to get the things done that we need as a society. It's really important to understand that what the government does is not any more important and probably less than how the government goes about it, to whom they entrust the people's money. Collecting taxes from all of us to give to corporate leaders, which is what in the end is going on, reproduces the inequalities we say we don't want as a society. Well, here's a way to get beyond the inequalities. Stop giving all government contracts to capitalist corporations build on, develop a worker co-op sector so that it
can get the job done for what the government needs while at the same time achieving much less inequality and thereby a much better society than what capitalism has been able to achieve. Stay with us. We've so I think that's a really great uh, point as well. Um, there's more to this. He actually expounds even further, but I'm not going to be able to play the entire thing. But I really want to just harp on the fact that he's saying he's talking about worker co-ops. And I'll put the link to that video in the chat so you guys can watch uh, the rest of it later. But it's so important as to how. And one of the questions is uh, worker co-ops. Uh, if some of you don't know what it is, then we're going to go over that, exactly what a worker co-op is. But one of the first things I want to talk about is I want to give a local example as to money going to corporations instead of worker co-ops and how that money is spent. I'm going to go here. So there was, if any of you who are local to Central Florida know that there was a project that was done called I-4 Ultimate, Interstate 4 Ultimate. And this was a long project where they essentially widened and created more lanes and more exits for I-4. So the I-4 corridor goes from northeast, kind of southwest, right? And the I-4 corridor is Orlando, Tampa, Daytona, and everything else in between, right? So that project really was a massive undertaking. But that project was also given by the state of Florida to one company, one construction company got all that money to, to, to construct this project. So I'm gonna go here. This is the agenda to I-4 Ultimate. Let me enlarge this just a little bit more so everybody can see. So this is from the Florida Department of Transportation, I-4 Ultimate fact sheet. It says the Florida Department of Transportation, I-4 Ultimate Reconstruction and Widening Project will take place on the 21-mile stretch from Kirkman Road to State 434 on Interstate I on Interstate 4. Of the 142 bridges along the corridor, 13 will be widened, 74 will be replaced, 53 will be new, and 4 will be temporary. In addition, 15 major interchanges will undergo complete reconstruction. New express lanes with dynamic pricing will be added to the center of I-4 to in each direction, providing a choice to drivers. Toll prices will vary based on level of congestion at different times throughout the day, which rate structure designed to help keep cars and express lanes moving at 50 miles per hour. The general use lanes will continue to be free as they are today. In addition, heavy trucks will not be permitted in express lanes. The I-4 Ultimate Project is expected to substantially improve the overall flow of the corridor. So, this says the total estimated project cost is $2.3 billion in year of expenditure dollars. $2.3 billion. That's a lot of money. And it went to one particular construction company, SGL. I tried to look up SGL as a company, and I kept getting referred to this particular site. I'm not sure exactly where else to go but sgl you know that is what i was shared uh 
This says, um, I4 Ultimate Improvement projects project reaches major milestone with express lanes opening in Orlando. So this was back in 2022. So this uh, is just, it's a lot of money. And when you have companies like this, is SGL a worker co-op? Because if SGL was a worker co-op, then that money would go towards the workers and not all the people at the top. But unfortunately, it doesn't go to all the workers at the top. Companies are pretty much structured to give the greatest amount of profit to the people at the top, not to workers. And just think if it was structured like a worker co-op, if workers are able to profit share and take that in, imagine how that would positively affect the local economy. Because workers wouldn't just be getting, oh, well, we're just going to get, you know, $15, $20 an hour. It's like you're getting some of that profit, which means you're going to get even more and then you get to spend it more locally. Let me go to what worker co-ops are. So this is out of Democracy at Work Institute. So it says, what is a worker cooperative? It says a worker cooperative is a values-driven business that puts workers and community benefit at the core of its purpose. The two central characteristics of worker cooperatives are workers own the business they participate in its financial success on the basis of labor contribution to the cooperative. Workers have representation on and vote for the board of directors adhering to the principle of one worker, one vote. Since in addition to the economic and governance participation, worker owners often manage the day-to-day -day operations through various management structures. It says a brief history of worker cooperatives in the United States. So, so says any business can be a worker owned and controlled business. The US work cooperatives tend to be concentrated in at the service and retail sectors. Uh, it says accommodation and food service, healthcare, manufacturing, engineering, technology, and design. Many other worker cooperatives in existence today were inspired by the Mondragon cooperatives in Spain, which enabled the Basques to lift themselves out of poverty and build what is today Spain's seventh largest corporation a worker cooperative. So as far as worker cooperatives are concerned, it's really workers essentially owning their own means of production. And through democracy, you actually get to choose the day-to-day -day operations, the structures and who actually helps run the company. Imagine being able to vote for your manager or people in upper management. Imagine being able to share in the profits, even if it, the profits are just given at the end of the year and it's distributed among the workers and it's voted on how it's distributed. Imagine. So imagine if you as a worker, instead of making just your base salary, right? You also get to share in the profits, not as a bonus structure that's decided by a board of directors, but it's actually decided on by all workers collectively and says, hey, this is how we want to give the profits to all the workers. Well, then you can actually do that. And imagine if a company like SGL, which was tasked to rebuild basically all of I-4, the 21 miles of I-4, 
and the billions of dollars that were given to them by the state. Imagine if those taxes that we pay to the state of Florida were actually given to a worker cooperative so that then that money essentially gets recycled and given back to the communities instead of just a small scope of people who are in the board of directors over companies like that. Imagine not just federally, but municipally and statewide that we did this with worker co-ops instead. Like for instance, imagine if I'm putting out a local company here that does road construction, Middlesex, right? What if Middlesex was a worker cooperative that was worker owned, that actually was given the money to, let's say if they're repaving, you know, Highway 50, Colonial, right? If they're repaving Colonial Drive, or let's say they're repaving a large part of Orange Blossom Trail, well, that money, you know, if especially if it's workers that are local, that that money gets recycled through them instead. Instead of it going all to the top of the people who are the shareholders. Oh, I wanted to see this. Ed Royce says, I-4 project was so wild. Big contracts, good jobs, right next to Crosstown and dudes from Crosstown barely got hired. Yeah. And I think that's important. Um, and one of the things that Dr. Sorry, I keep calling him Dr. Wolf. Um, Professor Wolf actually talks about is a part about giving workers the option of if a corporation wants to either restructure or sell or what have you, they have what's called right of first refusal, thus giving the opportunity for workers to buy the company and operate it collectively. And if you are able to do that for workers, like, Let's hypothetically say I work for Apple. Let's say Apple, right? And let's say Apple wanted to sell, right? Or they wanted to restructure in a, in a different way. Well, if a law was passed where they get right of first refusal, that means that they actually have to attempt to sell the company to the workers collectively. And if the workers actually want to, then the workers can literally buy Apple and then own it collectively as a worker co-op. Can you imagine if Apple was a worker co-op? Now, one of the things that uh, Dr. Wolf brought, brings out is how uh, Jeremy Corbyn and the Labor Party in Britain wanted to do a structure like that. And one of the things that he talks about, and I don't want to give it all away, but it talks about how Jeremy Corbyn said, well, how would people be able to afford to buy a company under right or first refusal? And he said, we would just loan the money to the workers. Wouldn't that be great? What if Walmart workers had the ability, what if there was a law of right to first refusal and somehow Walmart wanted to restructure. And then Walmart workers got the opportunity to actually buy Walmart collectively. And then workers could go, well, I don't have the money to buy it. But then the government goes, okay, we're gonna give you a very low interest loan to the workers of Walmart so that they can actually buy it. And then once the workers actually own Walmart, it's not, and, and, and people can come in and go, well, it's a publicly traded company. That's a publicly traded company. People who aren't workers can actually own pieces of Walmart. No, 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 no. We're not talking about public traded. We're talking about actual worker owners, people who actually work for the company 
and they actually democratically decide how the company operates from the person on the bottom tier all the way to the CEOs. Everybody gets one person, one vote. Imagine how it would fare better. Imagine how many people would actually fare better if all those profits were actually shared collectively among all the workers. It would be considered a privilege to work at places like Walmart. Do you, do you imagine how the turnover rate would slow down to a crawl? Nobody, how many people would actually want to leave? Especially if you get to choose and vote for your managers? Baby, I'll be trying to put it in my application right now. And so how could we implement a system like this without, you know, not without. We need to change the system, but in some ways we can try to implement this. Well, you also have things like citizen ballot initiatives they can probably try to implement. I mean, think about it. I think that would be pretty cool if we could implement that at least on a, if not citywide, a statewide level, you can do it through a citizen ballot initiative, right? And I talked about how that could be done in the last, in the last live stream that I did on Saturday about what is to be done. You can look into that, right? I think that's important that we look at ways to mitigate the disaster that this system is on us and while still trying to change the system, you know, from within, because ultimately, yeah, you know, some people may say, well, worker cooperatives isn't necessarily socialism. Well, socialism, part of socialism is workers owning the means of production and distribution and being able to, uh, you know, have democracy within the workplace. That is one of the definitions of it. Well, if having a worker cooperative is part of that, well, then implementing that and growing the popularity of worker cooperatives would be something that actually could change the nature of work. Because, you know, yes, part of that fight is organizing unions, but unions only work within a capitalist structure of the workers and then the capitalists versus if you have a, if you have a cooperative, the workers are the owners. So therefore there's not one person versus another. They literally own it. So there's no union necessary. I think that's important. That's what a worker cooperative is. Workers actually own it. Uh, Roger says here, uh, the workers are the owners of the company. What members would vote to move their manufacturing plant out of their community and stay outsourcing their jobs? How, wh why, why would you outsource your job? It's a good question. Like for instance, how many workers, it, let's say hypothetically, if Apple actually became a worker co-op, how many of the worker owners would stand and sit by while people in Congo are mining the cobalt in Coltan under slave-like conditions? Wouldn't the worker owners want to restructure it so that they actually pay fairly to the workers in Congo for the cobalt and coltan that go into their phones and their tablets. Because ultimately, they wouldn't want to get it by that, you know, means like that because then that keeps the system of exploitation in place. Workers have a lot more solidarity with each other than people give credit for. They don't want to see their fellow workers suffer like that just for their benefit. 
And would this mean that they have to spend a little bit more for the Cobalt and Coltan? Yeah. Of course. But would this also mean that there's less exploitation? And if you're not, if you're also profit sharing and all those billions of dollars, almost a trillion dollars, <laughs> wouldn't be going to the people at the, you know, at the very top and is spread throughout the rest of the workers in the company, then you as a worker owner would be making significantly more. And would you be okay with giving a few more dollars just for that cobalt and coltan in Congo so that the people who are working there can actually make a living wage in their country? And then maybe they can organize and then own collectively the mines of cobalt and coltan so that they can work out a better trade deal with companies like Apple while they're not being exploited. What if Tesla was worker owned? You know, these are some of the questions I think that needs to be asked. So Let me also share this link so you guys have that. All right. So, but yeah, so I think that's a really great video. Uh, by uh, Professor Wolf, I almost called him doctor again. You know, and I think we need to ask about how the government spends money. Uh, hang on. Oops. Says JB, you got to Google how much each worker would make if Apple was a worker co op. It'll blow your mind. Uh, okay. Oh, oh my, oh my, oh my God. Oh, let me share this. Mm. Hang on, Roger. Let me see this. Okay. It says if Apple were a worker cooperative, each employee would earn at least $403,000. Apple has 98,000 employees and earns. 39.5 billion dollars after tax over the past year. If Apple was a worker cooperative, then each employee would receive four hundred three thousand dollar dividend on top of their salaries. Even the lowest paid worker would earn at least four hundred three thousand dollars in Apple as worker cooperative. Oh my God! For full article in Forbes, what? Oh, I ain't disabled no damn ad blocker. Y'all can kiss my grits. Hang on. I'm going. Hang on. Nah, we ain't we ain't doing that. I am not paying for no damn article. And yes, I said y'all can kiss my grits. I'm trying to I'm trying not to cuss, y'all. And this was nine years ago? Hold up, wait a minute. What? All right, let me share this. Let me look the cut. Hang on. Nine years ago. 
This was in 2014? December, it says if Apple were a working cooperative, each employee would earn at least 403000 Can you imagine what it would be today? It said, oh my gosh. It talks about how a worker cooperative. Oh my goodness. Wait. How much did Apple earn the year prior? See, now you get me doing some research on Let me see. Uh, what did they make in 2023? Oh, damn. Hold up. Wait, hold up. It's the mother. D-R-E. Snoop Dogg. Okay, hang on. Okay, it says Apple net income from two. Let's see, Apple report net income of ninety six point nine nine billion U S dollars in twenty twenty three fiscal year, down from the highest net income of date in twenty twenty two. Apple's global revenue amounted to three hundred eighty three point two nine billion U S dollars that same year. Oh my gosh. Hang on. Are you kidding me? Golly, this company makes a lot of money. Uh, financial results for its fiscal fourth quarter, the company posted quarterly revenue of $89.5 billion. Um, let me see. Wow. I'm telling you, if workers actually owned this, this would be crazy. Mm -mm -mm. So, wow. Well, this is why I think workers should own the means of production. Just wait. Man, I, mm, it's a lot. So thank you for that, Roger. Thank you so very much for watching my channel. And I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.